must be familiar with all information related to your flight, like weather, NOTAMs, fuel requirements, runway lengths. So today we're gonna talk about cross-country flight planning and why we need to do cross-country flight planning. One of the main reasons that we need to plan for any cross countries that we're gonna go on is one, to make sure that we're conducting a safe flight, uh, and two, for legal reasons. Part 91103 of the Federal Aviation Regulations lay out some of the requirements for any flight that's not in the vicinity of an airport. So we have to make sure that we gather all that information. So one of the first things we need to understand about cross-country flight planning is why do we do it in the first place? Probably one of the main reasons is for safety purposes, to make sure that we are not flying into weather we shouldn't be flying into or potentially airports that we shouldn't go to. Another reason is because the federal aviation regulations require that we look up and become familiar with certain things with any flight that's not in the vicinity of an airport. If you go to FAR part 91103, it lays out that you must be familiar with all information related to your flight. And that's going to include things like weather, NOTAMs, fuel requirements, runway lengths. And we'll talk through each of those items so that you know exactly what you need to plan for when you're doing your cross country flight planning. One of the biggest things that we have to look up when it comes to our flight planning is the weather. That's where you're gonna probably spend the most of your time as you prep for a flight. Uh, and there's several different things that we need to look at when it comes to the weather. So when it comes to looking up weather, that's something that you can start several days out from your planned flight. You can know ahead of time whether or not there's thunderstorms that are expected to be going across your route that you've got planned out. And so if you know five days ahead of time that there's going to be thunderstorms, then that's probably not a flight that you want to make in the first place. However, if the weather is looking good, then as you get closer and closer to your time of flight, you can go ahead and get updated on the weather information. So main things we want to consider when it comes to our weather planning is one, are there thunderstorms that are forecasted? Winds are another thing that we can look at and see what the winds are forecasted for um, both our destination airport, our departure airport, and we can also look at what the winds are gonna be like when we're up in the air at our cruising altitude. Things that we can use to find that information, we can look at METARs for particular airports and that'll give us current information of what's going on at an airport. We can also look at TAFs that'll give you forecasted winds out to 24 or 30 hours ahead of time. And you can look at those forecasted winds to, to help make the decision whether or not you should go. Another thing we wanna consider are weather advisories, uh, such as air mets, sig mets, or convective sig mets. Air mets are advisories that give you information about moderate icing or turbulence or winds, low level wind shear or surface winds that are greater than 30 knots. Sigmets are going to be more severe icing, turbulence. Uh, there's also things that can be included in sigmets that uh, would also include dust storms or volcanic ash potentially. Not that we have to deal with that a whole lot here. And then lastly, convective sigmets are going to be related to thunderstorms, convective activity, tornadoes, hail, bad stuff that, that nobody wants to be involved in when they're in a plane. So you can look at, at those weather advisories as well. You can look at PIREPs as well, uh, and those are actual observations that pilots have actually experienced while they've been in the air. Those are particularly helpful if you're close to your flight time uh, so that you know exactly what's going on at that time. Ceilings are another important thing to take a look at before you do your, your flight. We want to know what altitude the ceilings are going to exist at because that may dictate whether we can actually stay in VFR conditions the entire route or potentially we may need to file an IFR flight plan in order to make it to our destination. So depending on whether you're a private pilot uh, that's, that's only able to fly VFR conditions or if you've gotten your instrument rating, um, that may dictate whether or not you're able to fly that day. Temperatures also can play a, a big part in your flight planning. Temperature affects the performance of your aircraft, whether it's going to take you longer or shorter to take off and land. So that can be pretty critical when it comes to airport selection. So that pretty much wraps up what we're looking at when it comes to weather. Uh, the next thing we want to take a look at is runway lengths. 
Uh, how long is the runway that we're going to be taking off from? Uh, we just talked about how temperature can affect our takeoff distance. We want to know what the runway length is going to be at our destination as well. If we're looking at the winds like we just talked about, that's going to influence which runway that we're potentially going to be using. So if an airport has multiple runways, one runway may be longer than another and we may or may not be able to land on that runway depending on, on what type of aircraft we're, we're flying and what the weather conditions are at that airport. So runway length is, is critically important to know before you go up on a cross-country flight. Takeoff and landing distance information that are specific to your aircraft are also important and required for you to, to gather before you, you conduct your flight. Like we just mentioned, weather conditions will affect your takeoff and landing distance. You can use charts and tables that are in your pilot's operating handbook for your aircraft, and you can select the appropriate chart for whatever the conditions are that day, whether it's, it's standard temperature or warmer or colder than standard, and you can use that to determine how long your takeoff and landing distances are gonna be. So it's important that we take a look at that, we plan ahead, and we know what kind of performance we can expect to get out of our airplane. It's also important to build in some margin with that. The tables that are in the POH are based on ideal circumstances and conditions, and rarely is that truly the case. Oftentimes we're not flying a brand new airplane out of the factory, so there is some instances where your plane may underperform what's listed in the POH. So we wanna build in some margin uh, so that we're on the conservative side of things and uh, have no doubt about whether or not we can uh, land or take off on, on whatever runway we're on. We also need to get information on potential alternates that we may need to use. There's gonna be times when unforecasted weather comes up. Uh, maybe ceilings drop down lower than you had expected, or the winds shift and now you're no longer able to use the runway that you had intended to use. Maybe there's a thunderstorm that, that pops up and uh, is close to the airport that you were planning to land at. Uh, those are all situations where you would need to divert and go somewhere else. So if we plan ahead and we have an alternate selected beforehand, that makes that diversion a lot easier and you're not having to uh, make things up on the fly. When it comes to selecting an alternate, generally, if there are poor conditions that exist at the airport where you're planning to land, you probably want to select an alternate that's not right next to the airport you were planning to land at because you're going to have similar weather conditions uh, at your alternate if, if that's the case. So when it comes to selecting an alternate, pick something that you know you can make, that you can plan your fuel for, but it's also far enough away that you're not going to be running into the exact same conditions as if you were to continue to your original destination. We also have to plan out exactly what our fuel requirements are going to be to conduct our flight. For a day VFR flight, we need to be able to have enough fuel to get from our departure airport to our destination and then fly at normal cruise burn rate for another 30 minutes. Uh, if it's a night VFR flight, that reserve has to be extended out to 45 minutes. So in order to get those fuel requirements, we have to, once again, look at the weather see what altitude we're gonna be flying at, look at the tables in our POH to determine what our burn rate is gonna be for our cruising flight. Uh, we also have to look at potentially other charts for the climb fuel burn. So those are all things that we'll need to look at on our POH, do some calculations to determine what our burn rate is for our climb, our cruise, and then plan in additional reserves so that we can get to our destination and beyond, whether it's day VFR or night VFR for whatever the required amount is. We also, once again, wanna build in some margin there. Typically, we wanna have personal minimums on top of that. So maybe your personal minimums require an hour of reserves. So those are things that you can plan ahead as well. Another thing that we need to take into account are any notices to air missions or NOTAMs, uh, as they're typically called. Uh, these are things that may come up and typically involved uh, temporary flight restrictions. So air spaces that may pop up where you're not permitted to fly into unless you're specifically directed by ATC through it. It could also be for runway closures or potentially VORs that are unserviceable um, or that are not working at the time. So when it comes to looking up NOTAMs, the FAA has a NOTAM search feature online that you can go type in what airport you're looking for, 
Uh, you can type in routes that you'll be traveling on and it will give you applicable notums for, for those areas. And then one last thing that we need to take into account are any known ATC delays. There may be delays that pop up uh, at particular airports due to weather or ground stops. Uh, so those are things that we want to be familiar with as well. Um, the FAA has a website that you can go to. It is www.nasstatus.faa.gov. And you can go there and see any delays that are currently going on or predicted on that website. And you can use that to help with your, your flight planning and see if any airports that you're going to might be affected. So that's a lot of information that you have to gather before any flight that you're conducting where you're going cross country. To try and help remember all those different things, there is an acronym that you can use. Uh, it's called NWCRAFT. And that stands for NOTAMS, weather, known ATC delays, runway links, alternates, fuel requirements, and takeoff and landing distances. So you can use that acronym to help make sure that you've hit all those items that you need to become familiar with uh, before your flight. Once you've gathered all that information and you're looking at it collectively, then you can start to put together your flight. You can select whatever course you want to go on. Uh, maybe it's a direct line straight from point A to point B. That's always the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, so if you can do that, great. If not, if weather's popping up and you have to divert a little bit, you can set your course to a different route and go around the weather. But having that full picture ahead of time helps you with that planning. So once you've picked your course, then you've also got to pick your altitude. And that's going to vary depending on what the winds aloft are that you, you gathered in your pre-flight planning. It, uh, it may also depend on airspace. If there are class Delta or Charlie airports that, that you may be flying close to, you may want to pick an altitude where you're above those, those airspaces. Another important thing to consider are obstacles. Um, so in your pre-flight planning, when you're looking at your sectional chart, you can look at the obstacles that are along your way and pick an altitude that you know you're going to be able to clear all obstacles that are on that route. But once again, having the full picture will help with making those decisions. So once we've done all that planning, it comes down to decision time. Do we go or do we stay home? Once you've got the full picture, uh, you can make an informed decision uh, whether or not this is a flight that you can actually conduct or maybe it violates your personal minimums and is outside of what you would be comfortable flying in. It all comes down to what your experience up to that point has been, what are the personal minimums that you've established for yourself or that you've worked with your instructor to establish. Going through, looking at the weather, looking at all the conditions that are gonna exist on your flight can help you make an informed decision and a safe decision so that you're not flying into a situation that you haven't prepared for. So now that we've covered all of that information information, you can go and, and make an informed decision for your next cross-country flight. All right, guys, that wraps up today's video for cross-country flight planning. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave those below. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss out on future thrust videos.